Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Susan Malazzo with the California MBA, and I'm very happy that you can join us for today's presentation of our Mortgage Quality and Compliance webinar. Um, as with most things in our organization, we are able to produce great content and education thanks to the wonderful sponsors in our industry. So I'd like to kick off today's webinar with thanking and recognizing the compliance group for their support all throughout 2021 as our mortgage quality and compliance uh, sponsor. And in uh, Jeff's place today, we have Jim McCracken from the compliance group to talk a little bit about what they do. Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Susan, thank you so much. And you know, the compliance group is very proud to support your efforts and the efforts of the California MBA, and especially the Mortgage Quality and Compliance Committee. Um, this committee is just one of the ways that Susan and the California MBA help us all to connect, collaborate, improve, and succeed. So for the past 21 years, the compliance group has been providing our clients with broad-based compliance-related services, such as federal and state audit preparation and response assistance, internal audit, AML, federal and state-based file reviews, but we also provide quality control as an outsourced solution for pre-funding, post-closing, and loan servicing. And at the Compliance Group, our leadership values integrity and unassailable ethical standards. And we're passionate about producing the highest quality work and exceeding our clients' expectations. If you've worked with us before, then I'm sure you understand what it means when we say at the Compliance Group, we instill confidence, calmness, and we make compliance fun. And Susan, thank you for your steadfast commitment to the members of the California MBA, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Always appreciate uh, your support um, with the Compliance Group. So with Our that, pleasure. we will uh, get into today's, uh, today's agenda. So the first thing I would like to do is uh, point out to you that if you look in the chat box in the drop down menu on the right of your screen, you will see that I've posted information about uh, not only our Mortgage Action Alliance, but also our upcoming Legal Issues and Regulatory Compliance Conference. That's happening December 7th and 8th in San Diego. Uh, just today, we uh, found out that we are very pleased to announce that Acting Commissioner Chris Schultz with the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation has agreed to be a speaker. So we were looking forward to welcoming Chris uh, as part of our program. So the link that I've shared uh, will give you information about the conference. Uh, you can register there and you can also check out sponsorship opportunities if your company is interested in being featured as a sponsor. Uh, we also have a, uh, a networking event coming uh, up. It's October 7th. It is focused on um, commercial real estate uh, lenders, but if you are in the area and you'd like to uh, join us, that'll be there our first return to in-person networking. So we're pretty excited about it. And that will be in Orange County again on October 7th. Uh, so I'll get to dig into our agenda here uh, a little bit and uh, welcome uh, Pat Zenzla, who is our lobbyist for the California MBA. He's gonna be talking about some priority measures uh, that we've been following this year. Legislative session has come to an end, and this will be kind of his wrap up for the year. Um, so Pat, I'll turn it over to you uh, to talk about our first bill. Thank you, Susan. And before I talk about the bill, just to give the participants and ideas to where we're at uh, in the legislative session. As you mentioned, the, the first year of a two-year legislative session adjourned um, on September 10th and actually adjourned early, which uh, doesn't happen often. Uh, they had until midnight and they adjourned at around 9, 9 p.m., so a little early, which is nice. Um, and the, uh, there were approximately 800 bills that have now moved to the governor's desk in the last few weeks of session and he has until October 10th to act on those bills. So still still some activity to go, but um, the legislature should be done for the year unless a special session is called. And then they come back um, the first week of January. As far as the bills that I wanted to talk about today, AB 13 was a bill that um, was uh, of great concern early on. It deals with automated decision systems. Originally, it would re if required that any entity that uses an automated decision system, which could be you know, underwriting, given the initial definitions in the bill, would have to do an exhaustive uh, study of their systems and 
show that there is uh, no discriminatory impact or if there is a discriminatory impact in any way to um, resolve that and then provide a detailed report to the regulator. Um, given the definitions and the requirements, um, there was a great deal of concern. The bill was later amended to only impact state contracts. So if you have an automated decision system in a state contract, um, you would have to provide that information. Um, and it, ultimately, the bill was held in Senate Appropriations Committee because of the cost. I think it was uh, estimated to have about a $1.7 million cost for the two uh, years after enactment, if it were to pass, and then an additional several hundred thousand dollar cost uh, on an ongoing basis. So the bill is dead for the year, but it was made a two-year bill, which means that it could move uh, again in January of 2022. So stay tuned on AB 13. It still could be active next year. The next bill I wanted to discuss very briefly is AB 175. This is, this is what's called the budget trailer bill. It includes several topics. One of the topics essentially was a follow-up to a bill that passed last year that um, was problematic for the industry, and that was SB 1079. That bill essentially allowed for um, eligible bid bidders to come in after a foreclosure sale and bid literally a dollar over if they wanted over the uh, foreclosure sale price, and, and they could do it within 45 days after, after the original sale date. Um, and then um, essentially be able to have that property as long as they um, uh, accommodate certain requirements. Um, it was very problematic for the industry and the trustees because there were a lot of confusing terms, et cetera, and processes in the statute. Um, and this bill will clean up some of the processes um, it, really in a technical uh, sense and deal with some of the timing issues and definitions. So it's one that folks should be aware of. It did pass out of legislature and um, it's on the governor's desk. And then the final bill um, I wanted to mention is AB 948. This bill deals with appraisals and essentially situations where there's um, a, a potential discriminatory impact of the uh, appraisal or some kind of bias in the appraisal. Um, and it would provide that in the sales or with the sales contract for a residential one to four property, there would be a notice say that the buyer is, is um, entitled to an unbiased appraisal and then provide information as to how the buyer can address those issues or who they can contact if they believe that there is discrimination. Or, or some kind of bias. Um, and that's with the sales contract and also in situations where there's a refi of a first mortgage purchase money transaction, the lender um, would provide that notice um, so that we ensure that in all situations you would have that, uh, that kind of notice. Um, the California MBA did support this bill. It did pass out of the legislature and it's on once again on the governor's desk. So those are the three issues I wanted to mention, Susan, today. Great. Thank you, Pat. And, uh, you know, uh, another, end of another great year for uh, representation for the real estate finance industry, thanks to your hard work. So I want to uh, thank you for all that you do to represent our organization and to help us protect access to affordable credit. So thanks, Pat. Thank you. Okay, so now I'd like to turn it over to Raymond Schneitzable, who is chair of our Mortgage Quality and Compliance Committee. He'll be introducing today's speaker, Sheila Oliver. Raymond? Thank you very much. Um, I, I am, I'm really excited uh, that we have Sheila on today. Uh, we all know that um, in our industry, we find it very fortunate when we have uh, conversations or at least can hear a message from our regulators. So I greatly appreciate um, Sheila coming here, I, I know, that I'm sure a lot of the attendees do, but I'm sure by numbers I can tell you that, so I appreciate it. Uh, let me introduce you, and, and I will read from here because I love the bio and she deserves, deserves every bit of it, so I'm going to tell you. So, on May 24th, Sheila Oliver joined the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation as Deputy Commissioner for the Mortgage Lending Program. Sheila most recently served as Vice President and UDAP Compliance Officer for CD National Bank in Los Angeles. In that role, she managed enterprise fair lending and compliance with unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices to ensure adherence to applicable federal laws, regulatory agent requirements, and examination procedures. 
Prior to City National Bank, Sheila served over the course of more than 10 years in a similar capacity at CTBC Bank, Citibank, Bank of America, Union Bank, and Countrywide Bank. She also has past experience at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation as a compliance examiner. Sheila has a BS degree and MBA degree from Pepperdine University. Sheila said recently she is excited to join the DFPI team because of the focus on consumer awareness, adding throughout my career, my background has been around consumer protection and fairness. The DFPI, DFP, sorry, the DFPI is built on preventing harm to consumers and enforcing fair lending practices relative to business services engaged in honest practices, Sheila added. She will report to Senior Deputy Commissioner Ed Gill, who notes, it is our goal to ensure that the DFPI facilitate and develops a program to keep Californians safe and remain in their trusted environments. She will be based in Los Angeles at the Sarah building. So Sheila, uh, I love the resume. We appreciate the fact that you are uh, both from the regulatory side and the business side. We appreciate that. So with that, no further ado, uh, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you, Raymond. That's great. It's so funny um, when they wrote that bio and they published it, I didn't realize it said 10 years. I did not work at all of those companies within 10 years. That would have been exhausting. And most of those uh, companies that I have worked at, unfortunately, we were bought out or, you know, some type of merger or something like that. But it's great to be with everyone. I'm I'm very happy to be here um, anytime Susan would like for me to come and speak about exams or what our hot topics are here at the DFPI. I am I am most certain we'll, we'll say yes and, and come aboard. So today I will discuss at high level uh, the top five identified issues our examiners have reviewed during the course of 2020 and half of this year. Now some keep in mind, um, let me back up. What I wanted to do was provide initially um, any exam related items that we found due to the pandemic. Um, that was the focus prior to my arrival, and I have great news to uh, present that there wasn't anything identified during the course of us being in the pandemic that related to pandemic issues. So that's that's good news. So without further ado, I will go over our top five issues that were identified during exams um, from January 1st of 2020 to around about the end of June or July of this year. So the first thing um, I think Susan said I have access to, there we go. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Okay, I think I went too fast. Okay, there we go. Um, the first thing I want to identify is the fair lending notice. As you know, when the examiners come in and um, they take a look around possibly when we were prior to pandemic, they would look around your lobby or inside uh, any of your businesses, or they would ask, now we're asking uh, about your fair lending notice for you to provide it to us. Um, in some instances, uh, it is not provided or it's not provided timely. In other instances, if it is provided and we take a look at it, um, it does not have the DFPI contact information, or it includes the DFPI contact information, but it also includes other agencies such as um, the FDIC or, or possibly Federal Reserve. Um, I am encouraging everyone to go back to their shop, take a look at their fair lending notice. Outside of providing it to the DFPI, my examiners, um, timely or providing it initially, I am asking you to go back and take a look at who the contact is uh, on your F fair lending notice. It's important to have the appropriate contact. Um, oftentimes, as I've been a fair lending officer at banks, um, there have been complaints, and I've also been the UDAP officer as well as for the complaints. A lot of consumers do not know who to contact. Um, in that uh, great um, information from Pat as it related to one of the ABs uh, for appraisals. There's also oftentimes a lot of appraisal discrimination, sometimes that a borrower feels like they've been discriminated against. 
they want to know who to contact, right? That would fall under that fair lending notice. So I just encourage everyone to go back, take a look at the contact information, ensures the DFPI. If it is not the DFPI, please update it accordingly. You can go out to the DFPI's website and um, include our address. And I believe the address that we have there is Sacramento. If it's not Sacramento, you can give me, uh, send me a note. Um, I will leave my email address. It should be the Sacramento address. If you see at Los Angeles, um, I will ensure that that is correct. Next item um, is books and records information. Um, sometimes the appropriate documents are not provided to our examiners. Um, sometimes the appropriate documents are not located in the file. Uh, we've also found instances of evidence of disbursements. Uh, the dispers disbursement information is not there. Any level of disbursement information is, is not provided or it's not in the file. Uh, trust account related documents are not provided or it's not provided to us timely. Um, I want to note that as it relates to books and records and things that are not provided to the examiners, if it's not provided timely, if it's just not provided at all, I want you to know that it has been, we have delivered to the examiners that there are times where you're not going to be able to provide us information timely. Sometimes you're just not able to provide it at all because of the pandemic. You know, some people are working at home. Um, you just have less staff. You don't have enough support. So we do recognize that. And we are not dinging anyone for that. Um, and, and there are measures that I have looked um, based on some of the information after me asking any identified is issues. I have gone back and looked at the reports where we have asked the licensees to provide specific documents to us on two, three, four occasions. And when they have not provided, we just document it. Um, I just want to let you know we are patient. We understand your, uh, it, it, we understand where you're sitting in this um, pandemic, but it is important to give us these documents. And we have asked several times, but we're not dinging you because of COVID related in instances. So I say all that to say, when we are asking for documents, it is a part of our examination review, as you possibly well, very well know. When documents are not in the file, it's important to keep documents accordingly in your files, especially if we're asking and it's not there. It's important for all level of compliance information is documented and is located in your file. So just, just wanted to let you know that um, we are con accommodating you due to this pandemic. Okay, third, truth and lending. Um, oftentimes we're not seeing the closing disclosure, we're not seeing the arm disclosure, we're not seeing any final settlement uh, statements in the file, um, or not in the file, sometimes the closing disclosure is not accurate, as well as the arm disclosure is not there, or it's the, the information of when the start of the arm will change is not accurate. Uh, the settlement statements are possibly not there or the settlement is inaccurate. Uh, finance charge calculations, we're seeing a level of different, differing information as it relates to finance charges. Um, I am just encouraging everybody, everyone to just check to your closing statement. Ensure that the closing disclosure, excuse me, ensure that all the information that is there is accurate as well as your arm disclosure as well as your settlement statement, including the calculation of finance charges. Um, we're finding an abundance of these items are not available or they're inaccurate. And um, it, it's, it's leveling out to write-ups, write-ups in the same instances. We're seeing the same thing over and over. And we're not certain if it's due to the pandemic. Um, it might be, however, this is information that's being disclosed to our consumers, and we want to ensure that what we are disclosing to our consumers is accurate. 
So again, I'm asking for everyone just to do a final check. If you've got a quality control group or a QA person that's reviewing this, um, I am encouraging you to ensure that this information is accurate, it's adequate, and we want to verify that whatever we're delivering to our consumers is appropriate. Okay. I'm sorry, here we go. I'm, I'm, I'm in control and it's, and it, there we go, there we go. Okay, um, fee overcharges. We're noticing um, there were many instances and this is what I was shocked about. I have some data here as it relates to uh, credit report fees. Um, we're seeing across the board for credit report fees at least 10%. 10% of our, our entire examinations that we've conducted from January of 2020 to the relatively in the June of this year or July of this year, uh, we kind of mixed it up a little bit because I needed this information. We're seeing 10% overall of all of the people that we've reviewed that the credit report fee is inaccurate or it's inconsistent. Um, I asked and I don't think they got back to me, any of my uh, top examiners, but I believe there might be some spousal information um, and uh, that was misapplied as fees. Um, so I encourage everyone to go back and take a look at your credit report fees and ensure that that information is, is accurate. Um, appraisal fees, we found some inconsistency with appraisal fees and sometimes um, our examiners uh, re in their review of the appraisal fee, um, they know that um, some appraisers charge differing amounts and, and, and we understand that, but there was some information there and I'm just taking a look at the data so that I can get this right. But there was some information that just required, that had some inconsistency. And I just wanna be sure that everyone is aware of that. So like there was a couple here where the notification was not sent to some of our borrowers as it relates to appraisals. Um, we wanna be consistent in that type of disclosure as well. Um, title insurance, the biggest thing on the title insurance was that we could not locate um, the information as it relates to title in the file. Um, I, Coming from um, a bank, I thought the title fee overcharge on that was pretty high. Um, just ensure that your overcharges for title insurance, that fee is, is, is appropriate um, and that there's no overcharges. And uh, lastly, as it relates to overcharges, related tolerance, we've seen tolerance fees or tolerance instances at a very high level. Um, I'm looking at 8% overall for all of the exams that we've done um, from that time period. Just want to uh, discuss, you know, tolerances. Um, that's very, very important. Um, sometimes with tolerances, um, it can get misconstrued. I just want to ensure that everyone is on the same page with those tolerances of overcharges. Um, I will segue into uh, the per diem interest overcharge. Uh, we had 162 instances of that, that turned out to be about 12%. Um, per diem interest disclosure was not given, that was a low uh, percentage. We found 29 instances of that. Um, per diem disclosure was missing. As I mentioned earlier, you know we've had some missing doc disclosures and documents that are in the file. Again, if you have a QA person, please go back and ensure, or if you have a checklist, ensure that all your documents and, and things of that nature are in your file. That per diem interest uh, disclosure that was missing, that's a high level, that's a red flag for me. Um, mortgage loan interest charge prior to funding date, we had a high instance of that, and per diem interest disclosure um, was not in compliance. Your disclosures were outdated. Um, Again, I just stress the over fee overcharges. If you ever need assistance on in anything such as that, please send me an email. I can get someone on my team to work on it to re get responses to you um, in a timely manner. Um, 
with me going to the conference a couple of weeks ago, I have some instances where uh, the licensees want me to come out to their shop and, and talk to them and take a look around and, you know, possibly give them some advice. I'm open to doing that as well. Um, again, the fee overcharges is a great concern to me. So if you need any help, please uh, send me an email. We, we are definitely ha happy to help. Um, and then as far as RESPA is concerned, upfront disclosures weren't provided timely um, to uh, the borrowers and there were escrow related violations as well. And that, and that kind of goes along with some of those fee overcharges with the escrow related violations. Um, as a caveat, our exam team closed about 151 exams in 2020. Um, I didn't have the numbers for 2021, but I have them now when I first talked to management. We have already performed 108, uh, 108 exams as of 2022, and we've cited uh, 3182 exams, I mean, violations, I'm sorry, so let me repeat that. Uh, already in 2021, we have performed 108 exams as of August 30th, and we have a total violation cited of 3,182. Um, this time, we were able to confirm that the number of violations that were related to the pandemic were not related to the pandemic, which is good news. And we will begin to be on track with tracking all of this information that I have provided in this PowerPoint and any violations down to the uh, trickle of labeling of violations by January 1st, 2022. We're already doing it because I wanted to begin uh, tracking this information, providing information to the licensees as it relates to uh, the violations we have cited thus far. But beginning in January 1st, we'll have a full program and a full picture of our examinations and what violations have been cited, as well as how many exams we have done uh, thus far. So with that, thank you, Susan, for giving me the platform. You can take it back. I appreciate you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, I uh, I have to say, and I knew that you would, but Sheila, thank you for providing this information. I mean, great, uh, great messaging for all lenders out there that are licensed in the state of California. These are the top items that they're seeing in examinations as far as right. um, you know violations. Great opportunity to go back and double check your policies and procedures. Make sure that you know you have something in place that you will be in compliance and not falling into these buckets. So Sheila, thank you very much for that. I, I think that we have a few minutes for some questions. I'm sorry, no, Raymond, did you have a comment? I, I thought I heard somebody I'm sorry about that. No, that was not me. Okay. So uh, if you have a question for Sheila, we do have a few minutes to uh, take those. You can type them into the questions dialog box and we will be, um, we will be taking a look at them. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you know what, Sheila, did you want to talk about the MLO applications? I can. I wasn't certain if you wanted me to go through that. Um, it was there for your information only, but yeah, no problem. I feel definitely. I'm sorry. I should, I should have let you finish on this because this is important. And I've actually had a couple of people, uh, lenders recently oh, yeah. ask me about it. And so I was able to kind of share with them what you um, and the department oh, have yeah, shared with me. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, let me share it for, for certain. No problem. Um, as you know, uh, in order to uh, be approved as an MLO in the state of California, you have to submit a license. Um, we are in the process of reviewing applications beyond 60 days. Um, right now, the abundance of people who are applying to be an MLO has just been so it has surpassed anything that we've ever seen. Um, and that is due to the pandemic, unfortunately, because people, right. yeah, people who have been laid off or, you know, they, they, they're out of work, they figure, hey, I can do this. This is easy. Or this is something that I've always wanted to do. So let me go ahead and apply for it. And I do not have enough examiners as we speak, to go through all of the applications to ensure everyone meets our statute, 
mandatory requirement. You know, as you know, you can't be, right. you can't have someone that has a prior history of felonies or a certain level of misdemeanors. And so we, un unfortunately, we've got to go through all of that to ensure that these types, this, this type does not meet or do not get approval, right? Because we, we, we don't want that. There's too much information to be had. There's social securities, there's uh, numbers, there's address, there's, there's P, PII information. So we've got to go through those things very carefully. So we're, we're over 60 days in reviewing and approving. Um, there's a volume of sponsorship changes. I mean, there are people who have started, and I'm just using this as an example, who have started with Chase and then two months later, they're with Bank of America. Um, it, it, it's, it's a ton of sponsorship changes. It, it's almost in the line of the applications we're receiving. In, in addition, when applications are submitted, most of them are incomplete. So then we've got to do another process to send notices or letters or emails to the people that say, hello, you're, you're missing X, Y, and Z. Right. <laughs> that takes yeah. time too. And then there are some that are failing to submit their renewals. Um, we have a big automated automation renewal process, but there's some renewals that we have to look through um, for final approval. So we are very much behind in that. Good news is um, I have been able to, and it's been approved um, for me to hire more people. Um, that's what's needed. It's an immediate need. Um, with hopes we can get them on by the end of November, early December. But as you know, even if I can get them on, they still have 30 days to train because the process is so intricate. So I am asking everyone to please be patient with us. Um, we just didn't think it was going to be such an abundance of applications coming in. And with our current staff, they just can't handle it. So I was able to uh, hire get the approval to hire more people. We just have to go through the hiring process, get them hired, get them on board, and then training. Right. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I think it's important for uh, lenders listening to this that they know that that's the situation at the department being very transparent, saying, you know, look, it's a, it's a matter of volume. It's not a matter of them ignoring you. Uh, or, or not understanding that they, they recognize that there is a delay, but they are taking steps to, uh, as Sheila had shared, you know, hire new staff, more staff, train them, and to uh, ex, you know, expedite this process going forward. So I, I really appreciate that, Sheila, and I think it was important for you know, everybody to, uh, you know, to hear that as well. Um, okay, thank you. Do you want... Um, CRMLA um, updates, um, do you want to share any information on this slide? Absolutely, I'll go really high on this. Um, receipt of in, uh, incomplete applications, I, I moved those CRML to the CRMLA team. They can help us with the incomplete applications. Um, and then I've also got five people from other programs to come in and help us with that because the incompletes are just as high as the uh, applications are coming in. So we've got someone manning that. Um, our surety bond uh, process is now electronic. So um, that gave me one and a half persons to come over and help with the, <laughs> with the MLO since we went electronic on August 15th. Um, now we're doing the uh, payment assessments through electronic uh, receipt and the annual reports have been timely. They're coming in, they look great. And the processing time of fingerprints is now going through electronically through the DOJ for those MLO applications. But I have the CRMLA team looking at those too because I need the MLO team to concentrate on the applications. So I just wanted to give a, yeah, just wanted to get a high level update on that. Um, we are working to the to capacity. We've got people working on weekends. We've got people working over 40 hours a week. Um, we're doing the best we can, but we're still at that 60. I don't want to get further than, I think we're at 63, uh, 63 days. I don't want to get any further than that. And that's why we had to get more people um, from other programs to help us. 
Right. And, uh, you know, appreciate the, again, that update and being, you know, very transparent with the licensees saying this is the situation at the yeah. department. Um, they are working very hard to make sure that they are accommodating the needs of their licensees. So, Sheila, that was great information. Thank you so much uh, for making yourself available. Now, I know some of you have posed um, some questions in the questions dialog box. So, I will try to get through as many of these as I can. Okay. I don't think I'm going to be able to get through them all, but um, I will first share that um, we will we have recorded today's uh, webinar and uh, it will be available on our MQAC committee page here in the next few days. So um, uh, let's see, question, uh, first question, can you tell us any more about the survey uh, regarding mandatory foreclosure readiness report? That's a great question, Alan, thank you. I was going to actually ask her that myself. What would you like to see servicers do in respect to uh, the available funds? So first things first is we want to keep people in their homes, right? And so if you've got any type of policy and procedure that is giving them the giving our borrowers more leverage to stay in their home, that's the encouragement. That's what we want. We don't want you to go off topic of your policy and procedure if that client just that you know you've exhausted everything that needs to be done so with that said based on the foreclosure ready, readiness survey we are we are just trying to see if our licensees are prepared and ready for when the borrower just says i just can't make a payment we just want our eyes open to see who's out there that is unable to do so because what we don't want is the same situation in 2008, you know, where people were out of their homes, they just walked away, they couldn't make the payment. This time we want to make sure that everyone's doing as much as they can to keep the client, the borrower, whoever in their home. That, that's, the, that's the purpose of the foreclosure readiness survey. It's just to know where are we, we as California, as the licensees, have the client, the servicer, what are we doing? How can we help? And then the funding, um, that funding is to ensure when you receive it, you're keeping your, your borrower in their home. That's how the money should be used. Can, can you use that money to keep your borrower intact in their homes? If you can put their payments to the end, if you can start them all over, what that what those funds help you do that that's the purpose of the foreclosure readiness perfect thank you and um for those of you who might not be servicers but are joining today's call if you're a servicer in the state of california you received a survey from the dfpi on september 15th uh yes. asking about your um, plans for borrowers exiting forbearance and that's what she was referring to now you have until october 15th to respond and uh, the california mba is committed to um, helping any servicers that might need assistance in um, you know, tracking down the information or how they're supposed to be responding. But we highly encourage you to respond so that our regulator has this information and will certainly be sharing it with policymakers, right? I mean, they want to make sure that the industry is preparing for um, our exit of forbearance. So very important uh, to respond to that survey and provide the information that they've requested. Um, Sheila, next question. Is there a checklist that DFBI can provide uh, in, I can get preparing their files? Um, this, this, you know, respondent had said they feel like they're doing the right things, but would love to have a checklist so they're not surprised uh, when the examination comes around regarding documentation. And I know that today you provided a number of the of the top examination findings, um, but is, is there a, a checklist of any sort? So we do have an internal checklist, but it sounds like uh, our licensees would like to see something uh, during the document request. I'm assuming that's what they're they're referring to. If we had sure. a yeah, if we if we if we provided a checklist during the document request that said, "Here's a checklist of what should be in your files." Is that what I'm? I'm assuming. Or, yeah, I would say that, or, you know, just in general, so that as we're trying to convey today, hey, these are the top, you know, these are the top violations, so we're asking lenders to go back and check their policies and procedures on these items, but, you know, if there was ever, you know, something, I think that, I believe that the request is, you know, something that not even in, certainly be in preparation for examination, but just to double check that what they have in place is correct. Yes. 
Um, we don't have one that um, that has been made public, but I just I think that's a good question. I think that's something that we could probably distribute during the uh, document request. That's a great idea. Sheila, have there been, you didn't note it today, but there have there been violations on LO comp rules? Um, have you seen a lot of those or have has that, I know you didn't list it as a top finding, but that was a, a question posed. I have a list here. Give me a one second. Yeah, uh, for sure. It's not on the list, so it may okay. be at one or zero. Okay, all right. Well, that's good information. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Course. I think uh, um, there's a question. I know that you had addressed this during the, you know, the MLO licensing, but there was an inquiry um, relative to, you know, change in sponsorship with LR, um, with MLOs. Is there any plan to streamline the sponsorship changes? Um, yes. Recognizing, yes. of course, that you know this is their livelihood. <laughs> I we understand yes. that it's you know volume. It's only so many people. But still, two months without a, a paycheck or a pipeline is, is tough for these individuals that work on large left commission. It is. So what I've done, uh, and very good question, because uh, Chris has asked me to review our, our process, right? Is there anything there that's possibly bogging our, our MLO down, right? And sponsorships is one right? They're working and then they got to change the sponsorship and then they're waiting for us to approve it. Right, right. Yeah, just yeah. like it's not a, it's not, I guess that it kind of got roots from, it's not a new application. You know who this individual is. They've already no, been licensed. No. They're just that's, moving. So yeah, thank right. you for taking a look at that. I think that's okay. a, a great point and uh, oh, yeah. we're happy. To, Absolutely. Gotta, uh, I'm in talks with legal to see if, if it's okay. Like, can we, can we, can we stretch it out a little bit, right? So if the if the MLO has been with us X number of months, X number of years, and there's nothing in their background, do we need to know if the sponsorship has changed within a certain time frame? Can we wait a year? You know, can they give it to us during the renewal process? Could they be one of those outliers that's not being automatically renewed? So I've given it to uh, legal to see how we can change it because we don't want them waiting uh, during our time period of review when they're not making any money. Right. It's just right. sponsorship change. It's just right. Sponsorship. Right. And that's different, but it all kind of contributes to your overall MLO licensing issue, right? Because it's exactly. all, again, it takes all all takes money. So relative to that, I have something. Are the job postings going to be on the DFPI website? This individual said they have people that might be interested. So. Yeah. So um, I'm work. I'm I'm. You can't see my paper, but I'm working on the job description right now. And I was supposed to give it to HR yesterday. <laughs> so we'll have gonna, we'll have it out. We'll help spread the word too. Maybe we can get some industry people yeah, in there in there I'll in there to help you. Afternoon. Yeah, I'll do it this afternoon. Um, because it was supposed to be posted on Friday. It's going to now be posted Monday or Tuesday, and it's going to be four. Um, limited term positions. Um, they are the financial institution examiner. And there will be four posted at the same time for the mortgage lending area of the DFPI. Okay. Right. And they're limited term because I begged. And so <laughs> sometimes we, we do what we have to do, right? It's like, I have to em emphatically tell you, this is what we need. Yeah, they're limited term only because of budgeting. So um, my budget has been approved for 2022, 2023, but I needed them now, not in July, right? Yeah, right. so that's why they're called limited term because they're giving them to me from the bucket that I had already uh, created. So um, Got it. The, the position will say limited term up to one year. So in July or August of next year, they will become permanent as long as they're working um, up to speed and adequately. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, what could be our last question? Um, as a company who has a subservicer, so this will be relative to the servicer survey. Yeah. What if their subservicer? And I had this question as well, so thank you for posing it. What if the subservicer doesn't get the information into the DFPI by October fifteenth? So I mean, we will we will give a grace. 
and I probably shouldn't say this, but <laughs> we will give them a grace of two weeks. And then we will start sending um, emails out to say, hey, where is it? What's going on? Do we need to come in and help? You don't want us to come in. <laughs> that's a nice way to put it. Would you like us to come and help? Um, and I think that that's, uh, you know, I think uh, part of the messaging that the our association sent out is if you do have a subservicer, you know, yeah. encourage them to start on it now and to and to meet that October 15th deadline. So they're not um, they're not having any additional follow up from, yes. um, you know, from from the from the department. Uh, well, that wraps up our questions for today. Uh, Sheila, thank you again so much. I, I'm very grateful that you can join us. Um, for today's presentation. I know that we'll see you at our Legal Issues and Regulatory Compliance Conference. Again, Absolutely. just a note, if you check in the chat section of today's webinar, I have put the link where you can register to attend or uh, purchase a sponsorship. So uh, our next webinar will be October 28th, uh, same time. It'll be on some quality control issues and our presenters will be the Compliance Group and ACES Risk Management. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you, Sheila, for participating uh, with us. And I appreciate all of you joining us for today's presentation. Have a great rest of your day. Great day. Thank you.